Well, welcome to the Truth and Precept channel. Today I want to look at a few chapters that lead up to the coming of Jesus Christ to, to the Americas in 3511. There are some important things in these chapters that I'll review in chapters 8, 9, and 10 that reveal that the people who have the experience with Christ in chapter 11 aren't exactly perhaps the people we may have thought they were leading into this experience. And I think this is important because it really, you know, the Book of Mormon, as I see, is a prophetic book. And the, the, the characters and events in it really convey prophetic allegories to us of what we can expect. And so this will really help us to understand more and more of these scenarios and who's who and and what is going to happen uh, when these events take place in the future. Now I'm not going to read through all my notes here or all the verses because I, I want to make this uh, a quicker video and get to, more to the point but you know you can pause the video and, and look at the information I have here that I have done on my own studies. Um, but I, but just per, in particular for this video, I want to show uh, the interesting aspect of who these people are who have the experience with Jesus Christ visiting them in the Americas. So starting here in 35 chapter 8, uh, one thing that's important is that Christ wanted to make sure right, that Samuel's prophecies were put in the Book of Mormon. And that is... Uh, for us to know, right? It wasn't for the Nephites, right? Those events had already, you know, happened. And so there are many signs that are given that we need to look for and pay attention. We're not going to review those in this video, but that will perhaps be an interesting future video to come. Also, another point here in these verses, I've been hearing a lot of talk about with the April 8th, 2024 eclipse, how that's going to be part of a three days of darkness. And, you know, I don't really see that playing out in that way, uh, you know, per this chapter here. And I won't go through all these here, but this gives us the events that lead up to the sign of the three days of darkness. And, you know, we have terrible storms, uh, exceedingly sharp lightning, cities are burning and sinking into the depths and being covered up, and just a lot of destructions happening. And, you know, highways bro being broken up, places being left de desolate, and ex exceedingly great damage that is, that is occurring here. Um, this is reminiscent of some of the destructions, the natural disasters that happen in the book of Revelation. And so I would expect you know, all these events, you know, these parallels, to take place that then lead up to a vapor of darkness and then to a, a space of three days, you know, three days of darkness, of that happening, of that darkness. What is interesting here, just a couple of notes. This vapor of darkness we see tied over, over here to chapter 10, where they are overpowered by the vapor of smoke in darkness. We get a little bit more detail. And another thing about how they were destroyed by fire and smoke. I can't help but think this has got to be some volcanic uh, interactions or explosions, eruptions that are causing the ash, right? It says smoke here. And so that vapor of darkness that they could feel, in my mind, happens that. And so, you know, if this is happening in America, we know that we have, for example, not that this is going to be it, but, you know, we have a super volcano in Yellowstone, Wyoming, that are is always kind of scientists are on alert for because of the massive explosion that could happen with that. But as we go down here, we come to a little bit of the description of the people 
who are going through this. So starting here in verse 24 of chapter 8, and in one place or location, they were heard, the people were heard to cry saying, oh, that we had repented. That is an indicator that these people were not those who had repented before. These are people who had to suffer through these natural disasters or plagues, as we might call them, because they did not repent before. And then here in purple, I have some indications, some key phrases that are tied to end times. So great and terrible day. This should really give us the illusion of drawing our minds to what we would call the second coming in, in our future. And so there's these people are saying, oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day. And then would our brethren have been spared? So who's who's our brethren? Right. So if we go over to 3510.8 over here, we will see here, now it came to pass after the people had heard these words, behold, they began to weep and howl again because of the loss of their kindred and friends. So that's who their brethren is. It's their family, their friends, maybe their church neighbors. Right? And they would not have been burned in that great city, Zarahemla. And in another place, they were heard to cry and mourn, saying, Oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day. And that just draws our mind once again back to Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, where it says, I'll send Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. These have second coming connotations to them. But these are, again, our people who did not repent before the, the destructions came, the judgments came. So, oh, that we had repented before this great and terrible day and had not killed and stoned the prophets and cast them out. Then would our mothers and our fair daughters and our children have been spared and not having been buried up in that great city, Moroni Ha, and thus were the howlings of the people great and terrible. So we see that play on the words. It was a great and terrible day. And that was really, as we see a reflection as well of how the people felt of, of that day, right? They were experiencing great and terrible things. Then crossing over to chapter nine, it came to pass that there was a voice among all the inhabitants of the earth. In my mind, one way we can understand this is you know, and saying all the inhabitants of the earth, you know, that didn't necessarily happen, right? When Christ came to America, it was a very isolated event. Um, but what this voice tells them is we get a triple woe here unto this people, right? woe unto the inhabitants of the whole earth. So, so we, it seems like the scriptures are expanding our minds to not just this isolated event that we are told about that happened in America, but it's acting as a historical allegory for a bigger event that will encompass the whole earth in the future. And so triple covenant curse, right? Except they shall repent because these people did not repent for the devil laugheth and his angels rejoice because of the slain of his fair sons and daughters of my people these aren't just any people right it's the same particularly his fair sons and daughters of his, of God's people were killed in this destructions and why because of their iniquity and abominations that they are fallen. Another word being they're in, they were in apostasy. They have fallen away from, from God. Behold that great city, Zarahemla, have I burned with fire and the inhabitants thereof. So Zarahemla being the capital of the Nephites. And then we get uh, destruction here of these cities 
that we're told about, why they were destroyed. Um, these, these cities were destroyed, as we'll see, because of their iniquities, their abominations, and because of the blood of the prophets and the saints. Right? We'll see who that's, those saints are. They are a separate people from these that are saying, oh, that we had repented. And so in each of all these these cities, we're seeing right their wickedness and abominations and that they persecuted and, and killed the prophets and the saints. And once again, it, it is repeated just over and over with all these cities what they were doing. So we can understand that these cities here are the Nephite cities and the Nephites being a symbol for those who had been given greater light and knowledge. Maybe there are some parallels to these cities in our day. You know, I don't know, but it seems like there is a reason why we are given each of these cities names that were that were uh, destroyed. Then we get here a verse in uh, so chapter nine verse nine. These are not God's people. Up above, these were God's people. These were part of those those Nephites who had been given given greater light knowledge. Right? And so, not my people is behold that great city Jacob Buath, which was inhabited by the people of King Jacob. So they weren't my people, they were the people of King Jacob. And right, and they were burned, and they, they were above all the wickedness of the whole earth because of their secret murders and combinations. For it was they that did destroy the peace of my people. And these, these people are contending against God's people, and they destroyed the government of the land, and so they right, were destroyed as well. And then we have a description of what I would understand to be perhaps the cities of the Lamanites, because we have the city of Laman and Gad, Kishkumen, and they did uh, similar things, right, because of their wickedness in casting out the prophets and stoning them, who, who, I, who I did send to declare unto them concerning their wickedness and abominations. And there was none righteous among them, um, there were some who did gather out. We'll find out later on over here, um, down here in v chapter 10, verse 18, where it says, also those who had been called Lamanites who had been spared. So there were some Lamanites who had been spared uh, and taken out probably previously to this destruction. And then we get some explanation here. And back, going back to verse, chapter 9, verse 13. O ye, O all ye that are spared. These are the ones who are saying, oh, that we had repented. Right, You are spared because ye were more righteous than they right, who were destroyed in the destructions. Will ye now return unto me and repent of your sins and be converted that I may heal you? So God is telling them things that they need to do. Right? They they were righteous uh, because they didn't, while they may not have uh, agreed with the prophets and the saints who told them about the doctrine of Christ, and but they did not, it, perhaps they were more complacent. They didn't do anything uh, to stand up for them. Right, but they also didn't kill, you know, go deliberately and trying to harm them or or persecute them. They were lukewarm, maybe we could say. Uh, Verily I say unto you, if you will come unto me, ye shall have eternal life. Behold, my arm is extended towards you. That phrase there is very reminiscent to in Second Nephi chapter 28 verse 32, where God says He is continually extending His arm day after day to the Gentiles. And then He says, "Behold, I am Jesus Christ." Um, 
So these people were more righteous, but they still had not repented of their, you know, their their sins, their false traditions, of their fathers that they had been following in. Uh, they were part of a fallen and apostatized people from God. Now here is where we get an understanding. We'll go off on a little tangent here, where he says, "I came, I Jesus Christ came unto my own." In verse 16, and my own received me not, and the scriptures concerning my coming are fulfilled, and as many as have received me. So there were people who received in the past, right? Received him, and to them have I given to become the sons and daughters of God. And even so will I to as many as shall believe on my name, for behold, by me redemption cometh. So he's saying here, there are a group of people who who received Jesus Christ and his gospel, and to them he's already given them to become his sons and daughters. And he's telling them, you know, just like I did with them, even so I will to as many of you who I'm speaking to, if you believe in my name, right, you can also become my sons and my daughters. And then he goes forth and tells them about, uh, some of the key steps in the doctrine of, of Christ. Right, Not only do they need to repent, but they need to offer up the sacrifice of a broken heart and contrite spirit. And then... If they do that, they will uh, be baptized with the fire and with the Holy Ghost, just like how it happened with the Lamanites, right? Where you had the pillar of fires come down with Nephi and Lehi in the, in in the prison. So he's going to do; those are part of the doctrine of Christ. These steps. What's interesting is this voice of Jesus Christ that comes is actually, I think, what I calculated about nine months before Christ actually came down in chapter 11. And so he he has give, he's given them time here to figure out how to repent, how to be humble, how to perhaps toss out the precepts of men that they had been raised with, those false traditions of their fathers, and accept the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the doctrine of Christ. And so he's going to give them some time to do that before he comes and visits with them in chapter 11. And therefore, whoso repenteth cometh unto me as a little child. Right? We need to become as children, putting aside everything we thought we knew or had been told as adults. We need to become humble and teachable. Um, you know, behold, I've take I've laid down my life, I've taken it up again. Therefore, repent and come unto me, ye ends of the earth, and be saved. So, just another tie, and to he's talking to the whole world here, you know, to these various perhaps locations. Not quite sure how that will work in physicality, but it's much grander scale than just like a Zarahemla. Now we come over here to chapter 10, 3 Nephi. And, you know, the the people, you know, they were howling, right? Uh, they were lamenting because of the loss of their kindred, which had been slain. And, and then there was silence for the space of many hours. And then the voice came again. And it says, O ye people of these great cities which have fallen. And I put over here the list of cities and how they were destroyed. It may have some end time applications to us. And what we get here is, I think, the greatest understanding of who these people are what they failed to do. He, Jesus tells them, how often have I gathered you 
right, as a hen gathers their chickens. And again, how oft would I have gathered you? Right? Oh, ye people, right, who have fallen, right? You're in apostasy. And as ye have fallen, yea, how often would I have gathered you? And, O ye house of Israel, whom I have spared, how oft will I gather you, if ye will repent? So what we can see here is that God says, I tried gathering you out, and again, I've you know, I would have gathered you out because you were in apostasy if you would have repented. And I would have done it often. And not only that, though, I will still right, extend my arm, give you another chance to gather you if you will repent because they haven't repented yet. They haven't changed right, with their full purpose of heart. And so what we can understand here is these are people who experience these natural disasters and they are howling and just lamenting because of the destruction of their cities, of their families and friends, neighbors around them, because they did not repent and they would not be gathered, you know, assumingly, to a Zion. They would not physically be gathered out. And Christ is telling you, telling them here, I tried to gather you. I tried to pull you and have you under my wings because you were in apostasy, you rejected it, and you would not repent. But I tried to gather you out. So these are people who we can come to understand will not go to, to Zion when it is established in the end, in, end times. So from a LDS perspective, right, there's a lot of, there's a big push that is uh, being made that Zion is where you are at, that you don't need to go to a new Jerusalem and You'll be safe where you are in, in your stakes. But we are told repeatedly throughout the scriptures that all those who, who will not flee to a place of safety, that gathering place that we are told, right, will suffer the same consequences as everybody else who does not go. Right? They'll be left behind. Uh, and we, as we come down here, and thus far, in verse 11, were the scriptures fulfilled, which had been spoken by the prophets. And it was the more righteous part of the people who were saved, and it was they who received the prophets and stoned them not, and it was they who had not shed the blood of the saints who were spared. Okay. So they didn't try to kill and persecute these prophets who came and gave them warning, perhaps were ones who were telling them to be gathered out. So they didn't fight them, but it didn't seem like they stood up for them either. And then here is, in my mind, just, just a clincher of how these are prophetic allegories for us. We're told towards the end here in verse 14, and now, whoso readeth, so whoever's reading this account, let him understand. He that hath the scriptures, let him search them and see, and behold, right, if all these things are not unto the fulfilling of the prophecies of the many of the holy prophets. So he's telling us here, kind of breaking that barrier with us who's reading this text and telling us you need to understand these scriptures are prophecies, right? prophecies of things to come. And they're going to happen. They're going to be fulfilled. 
and so you need to search them because they're going to they're going to apply to you and let's see here i want to come back here over to these sons and daughters of god who had received and this is who i think they are uh, being tied over here to revelations chapter 7 right where did these elect go and so and after these things i saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth beholding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth nor the sea or any nor on any tree and i saw another angel ascending from the east that has end time servant connotations there how the, in isaiah the servant comes from the east having the seal of the living god and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea right these natural disasters saying hurt not the earth neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our god in their foreheads so this you know an end time servant here who comes from the east he's telling the angels don't cause these natural disasters to happen yet until the we have sealed the servants of god in their foreheads right? and then we get told that's 144,000 i don't know if you know that that's a symbolic number or literal you know it's it's not clear i imagine there's not that many uh, compared to the entire population of the world that are going to be in this situation so perhaps that's a you know a physical number and one of the elders answered saying unto me what are these which are arrayed in white robes who are these people and whence came they where did they come from and i said unto them sir you know and he said unto me these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of their lamb these are the the elect, the prophets and the saints, which, according to this, are comprised of this 144,000. These are the sons and daughters of God who received him, as we're, as we're told over here. They received God. Therefore, they, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. And they shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living waters, fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all their tears from their eyes. Now this could be interpreted as some type of rapture. Perhaps you know, they, are, they are being taken to God's temple in the heavens which has an interesting parallel with the story of Enoch uh, Enoch who called repentance and gathered a people who were then taking up, taken up into heaven it's kind of a rapture type uh, theology there or it could just be also you know a Zion here on earth as well you know in a specific place that that uh, you know as God had told them before you know he's he's trying to gather people he's trying to gather them and so these people did gather they re they had repented and they uh, came out of great tribulation which tells me that's not before the great tribulation but some you know somewhere in between or towards the end even is they are coming out of that that experience and so after the great tribulation that's when we then you know according to revelations and then also over here is when we start to see all of these natural disasters and then lastly and i don't have it on here but chapter 11 starts out the people 
who had not repented, who have gone through these destructions, and God had told them, I tried to gather you, right? And they've been humbled greatly because of the things that they have suffered now. They've been brought low. And, you know, they, they're starting to gather, and they gather at, you know, a temple that's in the land. In my mind, you know, as an LDS person, the, you know, the way I see that is that this is what these people knew. Why would they go, you know, we wouldn't expect, for example, a Baptist or, you know, Presbyterian to go gather to a temple. And so this record here, which is, be, is, which is studied, you know, by, by the Latter-day Saints, is, in my mind, speaking to us Latter-day Saints, because we're the ones reading it. And it's these people who are surviving here, you know, represent the, the, the group of LDS people who had not repented because they were in apostasy, they were fallen. And they didn't realize it, or they didn't want to realize it. And so what do they naturally do is they, right, they gather around their temple. Right? They're, they're learning the doctrine of Christ, learning how, you know, what does it mean to offer the sacrifice of broken heart, contrite spirit, so that they can receive the three baptisms of water, fire, and Holy Ghost. And so, and so they're gathering at this temple and... You know, as they're discussing with each other, uh, you know, everything that's happened, that's when Christ then comes down. And I don't say that's going to be necessarily, it's not supporting that the LDS temple is necessarily, you know, God shows up there because that's his house. right? But but he's, he's going there because that's where the people have gathered because of maybe their traditions, right, uh, to gather at, at such a building. And so I hope this has been illuminating for you to understand that the people who had this experience with Christ were those who did not gather out before, right? who, who according to chapter 7, you know, may be part of that 144,000 who are with God you know, at his throne. They are before his throne. And these are the people who did not repent. They were they were in apostasy, but they'd been given another chance, and 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 they they get that experience with Christ you know, on earth, you know where they have started to gather them, and so you know that that's that was eye opening because you thought these were the righteous people, but when you actually look at all the text, they weren't, right? and so you know it's should be all of our hope that each of us can make it out uh, before these natural disasters, accept the doctrine of Christ in its simplicity without the, all the extra add-ons that the uh, covenant path adds to, to that, you know, as that requires that leads you, you know, to a great and spacious building as the great symbol of church membership that's not the correct path to Christ. And you know, may each of us repent, right, in changing our course, right? not just saying, God, I'm sorry, but to repent, to change, to manifest that in each of our lives. And, and that would be my, my hope and prayer for all of us. And thank you again for listening. Uh, if you have any insights or comments on that you may have on these chapters, maybe around these some of these cities that, that you've discovered that you can share with uh, with everybody. That would be great to hear. But other than that, thank you once again.